Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation, the podcast that explores the reality of a word in danger of losing its meaning altogether. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Janice Fraser on the show today. She is a sought-after guest lecturer, speaker, advisor, and the co-author of Farther, Faster, and Far Less Drama, How to Reduce Stress and Make Extraordinary Progress Wherever You Lead. Janice, welcome to the show. Janice, I am so excited to have you on the show today. I anticipate an amazing conversation, and I can't wait to dive in. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am really glad to be here and to be talking to you and through you to all of your listeners. Fantastic. Let's dive right in then. What, to your mind, is innovation? So there are two definitions that I really like, and I kind of choose the way that I talk about innovation based on context, because I think all of us are innovators. Every human is a natural born innovator. But one definition I actually got from NASA a long time ago, Mm. and it's value from ideas. Mm. And it was the deputy administrator of NASA who was talking on a panel, and they said that this was their definition, his working definition of innovation. And I really liked it because it was so broad, but also really specific. And obviously the breadth is like, it's a fairly general description, but the specificity is that you have to create value. Right? It's not enough to have the idea. It's not enough to do design thinking or whatever and come up with a lot of great narrative or screenshots or whatever your venue is for innovation. <laughs> right. Innovation is about what actually comes out the other end and what change is created as a result of the effort and the novelty. Mm. And that word novelty takes me to the second definition that I like. It was presented to me by a gentleman named Dan Ward, who recently wrote a book about innovation that I'll talk about in a minute. And he says it's novelty with impact. So his definition really focuses on the newness and newness is contextual. So something that's new in industry might be well known in another context in government and vice versa, right? What is old hat in industry might be really novel in a GovTech context, right? Mm -hmm. So novelty with impact really also speaks to that sense of like what comes out the other end, value from ideas. Yeah, those are so great. What I love about both those definitions is they are dense. Three words. Yeah. Actually, both of them are three words. They contain, you know, multitudes of concepts and frameworks, and they exclude a lot as well. Mm. The first definition you talked about, value from ideas, to me, one of the things that jumps out is that it excludes serendipity. Mm. There are a lot of valuable things that people stumble across. Yes. There are a lot of valuable things that people sort of inherit or find. Mm -hmm. But in those three words, it implies that you're extracting. Yeah. There's an act of pulling this value from these ideas. Volition. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's an intentionality to it. Yes, yes. And whenever there's intentionality, I feel like there's an opportunity to codify, build a process, make it repeatable, or at least to get curious about how it happened the first time to see if you could do it again. Yes. And when I think of NASA, I think of curiosity. Yes, and that routinization, right? So you do a thing one time, and then you make it repeatable, and then you make it routine. Mm -hmm. So I think you can hack through the jungle. And then you have a path, but then eventually, if the path is really successful, you might want to pave the path. And all of those metaphors are really talking about how do you create lasting change, Mm. right? So there's, in addition to excluding serendipity, it excludes sort of the one-off, the it only worked once, right? And at least in my interpretation of it, it's how are we making progress together, toward an outcome that we all believe in. And those two ideas of progress and outcome are really powerful, like, again, really dense words that mean more than their few syllables would indicate. Indeed. And you can't do that if it's accidental. You can't do that if it's not repeatable. And you can't do that if you're not willing to declare victory on some things, right? I'm going to pave this road. 
And then we're going to keep moving on to the next thing. Right. So progress is about like, I'm going to step forward into a new space. I'm going to make sure that's working. Then I'm going to, it's like, there's a letting go. I think that I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. There's like a progression where the thing that was innovative five years ago is now established. Yeah. And so we have to move into the new space. There are probably highfalutin words like liminar space. Right. Yeah. I don't know. There are some fancy words that talk about the potentiality of the next thing. Sure. And in our earlier conversation, we touched on like how urgent the need is for us all to make collective progress because the world is a little bit on fire. Mm. At least from my perspective, it feels like the world's on fire. Sure. And so what we need is for all of us to be working toward a future that has better results. Mm -hmm. We need to be working toward an intentional something better. Right. And that means that we have to make a lot of progress right now. We need all of those ideas and we need to get all the value we can. And then we need to move into the next set of ideas and the next set of value because we have to get ourselves out of a bit of a difficult spot. That's so well said. And I think it's the difference between holding on to the how and holding on to the why. Mm. So your description is perfect of making progress and trying to fight the urge to fall in love with that progress. Oh, I've created a device that can send email wirelessly from a phone-based structure. It has a keyboard. I can fall in love with the keyboard or I can fall in love with the benefit it provided. Right. And if I fall in love with the benefit, I'm probably moving forward technologically. Mm. And I think the world on fire analogy is a great one because whether you're saying socially or environmentally or any other definition of our shared experience, we have to find a way to be able to make progress, see it as progress and not fall in love with that moment, that technology or that slice of reality that is that progress. Right. And just stay in an innovative mindset. Right. To continue to, to solve forward, to solve the next problem. Absolutely. And there's so much about the world of innovation that when I discovered it, it was like, oh, these are my people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And a part of what makes innovators different, I think, is almost an aggressive optimism that says, that declares the future is better than the present, right? And I'm kind of mad. I'm kind of mad that the present is the way that it is. And so I'm going to step aggressively into this future of potential. And I'm going to drag a whole bunch of you with me. And together, we're going to manifest some stuff. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> that's and exactly right. I mean, we don't talk that way, but that's kind of how it feels to me. Right. And that in there is so much richness. There's impatience for better. There's belief that better is achievable. And there's belief that better is achievable if we do it together. And the people who are doing innovation in large organizations, which is where I've spent a lot of time in the last decade, sure, very, very large organizations, federal government or Procter & Gamble or some of these other Nike, some big companies. Uh -huh. And what I find is that the people who are successfully transforming these organizations to be more innovative are people who do it together. Mm. And so it requires a different kind of leadership, which I think is a very modern style of leadership, where instead of having a knowing mindset, instead of having that, I'm rewarded for knowing all the answers, right? these people tend to frame the question and they tend to be very skilled at laying out a problem space that a group of people can then attack together. Mm -hmm. And so that shift in the fundamental skill of what it is to be the leader. So instead of being the leader that knows things, I'm the leader that frames things. Mm -hmm. That's a huge change in the narrative around what leadership means. If you look at the, the bookshelves, right? You go to a business book section. You're like, oh, I'm going to buy myself an inspiring business book. And it's like, you know, the next Walter Isaacson, with respect to Walter Isaacson, like <laughs> biography of some billionaire white dude who's really kind of a jerk, but who gets all the credit for being innovative. And you know what? That approach literally doesn't get things done. Right, right. And if they do, it's at what great cost? That's exactly right. That's perfectly said. And one of the other unintended 
consequences of the popularity of his writing and the, the people he writes about, I think, is that it implies that the next great thing will only have one person on the cover. That's right. And that's just not how the world works anymore, to your point. No, it's not how the world works, in fact. And it's also not how the world ought to work, right? Like, mm. it is truly, in my view, and here I'm going to go super, like, kind of political, it is immoral for that to be the idea of how work ought to be done, how mm. progress ought to be made. Mm -hmm. The idea that we're going to choose heroes, anoint those heroes, give those heroes billions of dollars and allow them to be tyrants. It's not okay. No. And what is particularly, I'll use the word infuriating because you're... I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's particularly infuriating about it is those things in another type of person would have had that person fired within 12 to 18 months on the job. Yep. There's an undercurrent of privilege that turns these quote unquote character flaws or whatever into delightful eccentricities. That's right. In certain people with certain privileges and certain advantages. Sure. When the same traits <laughs> yes. would get another person fired six yes. months into the job. And <laughs> yes. People like me and you, we're policed. Yeah. Like right. we're like, they're like, yeah. no, 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 no. The line you get to walk is very narrow. <laughs> exactly. 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 And every time I see something that says, do this like Steve Jobs or do this like other people, it just feels like folks don't fully understand the lived experiences of a lot of people in the corporate world and in the world at large when you talk about things in that context. Absolutely. So I've recently been appointed to the faculty of Columbia. I started work about a month ago, so I'm still developing the class. It starts in a week, so I'm, I'm on the, like, <laughs> I'm on a fast line. track, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's an executive master's of science in technology management. Oh. And the leaders of this program um, have been on the job there for, say, a little bit less than a year, maybe eight months. Sure. And are really refreshing the curriculum in a way that will really bring effectiveness and ethical leadership into the curriculum. And this is what appeals to me. They come out of a civic tech background. They have done just amazing things at the city of New York's technology kind of practice mm. and really visionary folks. Mm -hmm. And it's so exciting because the people who are already in this program, who the students and the faculty who are in this program are these very progressive thinkers who share this sense of, let's call it impassioned optimism, right? Like, <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I bring this up because I've been developing the reading list for the curriculum. Mm. So I'm teaching this like second semester of program and it's been almost impossible to find books that I can use in my curriculum that were not written by, I'm going to just say it, white dudes, <laughs> right? Right. And so I went looking at the business bestseller lists for the last couple of years. And every week on the book scan bestseller list, it's 45 white dudes. And for me, I'm looking for women, right, five right. women. Yeah. And two of them are, you know, Brene Brown and Kim Scott, and it's the same ones over and over again. And then three randos who are there for a week or two. Mm. And so it's like when we say that there's this mythology that's built up around what it is to be innovative, what it is to be an effective leader, what it is to be able to make change, like the rest of us are, we're busy getting the job done. Right. And the institutions, the publishing institutions, the literary agents, the whomever, whomever, anoints all of these folks, they're missing the point, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a Knight Foundation study a few years ago, and it was about who controls the capital in the United States. $71 trillion under management in the United States mm -hmm. and 98.7% owned by white men. With all respect to white men, they're fine, right? right? right. <laughs> but literally straight white men are less than 20% of the human population. Wow. And control 98.7% of assets under management. So yeah. these things blow my mind. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. when I think about how as innovators, like, 
So those of us who are drawn to this practice of innovation, I'm going to always bring it back to innovation. Yeah. We're drawn to this practice of innovation because we're impatient to see the world be different from what it is. And we know that if we do it together in partnership, we can get there. And we know that change is possible and we know that it's going to be hard. And so we put ourselves in these situations, whether it's, I've been working with Procter & Gamble for eight years, like their innovation team is amazing. And it's a bunch of folks who don't quite look like the normal VP of whatever, whatever, but they're changing the whole company. Mm-hmm. Procter & Gamble has transformed how they do disruptive innovation. And it's going to allow them to be more effective in their ESG, right? Right. It's going to allow them to figure out what is the alternative to plastic packaging. Right. I'm kind of going all over the map. So you got to tell me which no, thread you want to th- pick no, up. That is, that's, <laughs> so the, <laughs> the thread is innovation. And the fact that you are able to weave all of those different topics together coherently is credit to your thinking, but also one of the core points of this podcast, which is it's all the same thing. It's all one thing. It's all related. It's all connected. And and once you see things as being connected, you can pull value from ideas in other domains because like you said, it's context specific. I'm a big fan. He's a, a white man. He passed away recently, but I'm a big fan of David McCullough's writing. Mm. As a biographer and all those things, I feel like his writing is the most objective and the most humanizing of a lot of the biographers. And I think his biography of the Wright brothers, it's one of my favorite books on innovation. Oh, this is interesting. You're the second person to tell me about the Wright brothers. And I, so the author again is McCullough? Uh, David McCullough. Mm, Nice. Yeah, he's written so many books. He's got great quotes, but people know him as an author and historian, but he was also, he talks about music. He was a painter, just a real Renaissance man in our era. And the way he described the Wright brothers' experience is at such a human level of trying to solve the problem of powered flight. These two bicycle shop owners from Ohio, sons of a minister and their sister, and what they did to try to figure out and solve this problem. And it's just pure innovation before the word was invented, before the industry came along, all those things. Mm -hmm. It's just a pure story of two guys that don't have the education they're supposed to have, don't have the advantages they're supposed to have to solve this problem. And that's about as close as we're going to get, I think, historically to that kind of story. You know what I mean? (laughs) So the Wright Brothers is about as close as I've seen. But back to innovation as a novelty with impact, that second definition. I think the novelty piece in education, in GovTech, in all these other places is there are antibodies. And I worked at P&G for 10 years in research and development. Mm -hmm. That was my first 10 years in corporate America. So I Mm -hmm. fully agree with you about that organization. They don't have the antibody. There There are big organizations. And then there are big organizations that fight change. And somehow Procter & Gamble, compared to other big organizations, they don't fight change with the same level of aggression that others do. Agreed. But yeah, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about, I'd love your perspective on the antibodies or the, the resistance within very large organizations and how you navigate that with this consistent optimism and hope for the future. Yeah. Yeah. So first I want to give credit to the author of this book. It sits next to me. It's called Punk. Oh. Just is self-published by this guy, Dan Ward. He should be your next guest. Oh, yeah. And it's prompts and provocations for authentic innovations. And so he compares and pulls lessons from punk rock because those of us who are in these large organizations making this disruption happen, working toward innovation. Like we kind of are living a fairly punk rock life, right? (laughs) (laughs) Whether we self-identify in that way or not. Right. And so he's the one who uses the phrase novelty with impact. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Dan. Yeah. What you're talking about with these antibodies, it's real, Mm -hmm. right? No doubt about it. It's real. And the truth is there has to be a compelling reason for anyone in such an organization, such an environment to choose different 
to choose to try to change the status quo, Mm -hmm. which on its face is a disruptive act. So I think about it like, and here for people who are listening, I'm drawing a triangle with my hands and I'm slicing off a little side piece of the triangle. So the way that I deal with that is I start by slicing off a side of that triangle. The triangle represents, you know, the top of the organization, the middle of the organization, and then the big bottom of the organization. Mm -hmm. Every organization has some, maybe they're iconoclastic thinkers that have made it toward the top. And so what I try to do is involve very few people. In an organization of 30,000 people, I might want to only be in relationship with seven or 10 Right. as an outside innovation consultant. I want to find the seven or 10 and they have to be across level, mm. right? It doesn't matter if they're across department. They have to be senior, senior people to provide air cover and they have to be the active middle, not the frozen middle necessarily, but the people in the middle who are good at getting stuff done, Yes. right? The active middle and then the doers, the hands-on, the people who are actually going to execute and who are going to care about the fiddly little details that the middle and upper folks can't be bothered with legitimately, right? Right. So I try to slice off the smallest possible group of the most bright lights who are like, what if we could do something different, right? And so you find those mischievous people who are willing to engage together and you say, okay, what could it be? What might we try? And then I widen that wedge a little bit and then we widen the wedge a little bit and we widen the wedge a little bit. And one of the things that we did early on in this one huge organizational transformation that we did that really, really helped is we gave everyone permission to ignore the laggards, to ignore the haters, to just fly under the radar, ignore them. We'll get to them later. And five years later, it turns out we did get to them. Mm -hmm. So Back in the 90s, there was this crossing the chasm model. Do you remember crossing Mm -hmm. the chasm? Yep. Yep. So what that said is you've got a bell curve of technology adoption, but somewhere toward the beginning, as you climb that bell curve, like it is an uncanny phenomenon that a lot of innovations just never, they never get past the height. They like fall into this and they called it the chasm. From the early adopters making that leap to the, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I I believe it was Jeffrey Moore's model. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got the terms early adopter, early evangelist, like these teeny tiny, small groups of people who are like super excited. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about these early evangelists who are like, yes, this transformation, this innovation situation is really cool. And I treat an innovation transformation like that adoption bell curve. Right. So we have full permission to ignore the majority of people for a very long time because we've got to work out what is it that's going to be contextually appropriate here. Mm-hmm. And then as we start to go out a little further, what I try to do is like you kind of like lay out your offerings and you see who gets excited about it. I like to find ways for the innovators to declare themselves. Ah. They're all over your organization. Yes. Right. I just want to make them show up. Right. Right. Is there a way you can get them to raise their hands? Can you do an event to get them to show up? And you're like, oh, and now your name is on a list. <laughs> right. <laughs> gotcha. And then you invite them for more. Yeah. And the people who are hungry for more, you feed them. Mm. And so now you're at a dinner party and you're feeding the people who are hungry. And then suddenly it becomes a big dinner party and you're feeding the people who are hungry. Right. To get more and more people feeling positively about innovation. You need to feed and fuel the people who already feel really good about innovation, right? who want to create more. And so there's a communication aspect that I look for as well. And that's like, what are the hero stories we tell? Yeah, We can call them case studies, but I really like hero stories. Like Mm. what's the hero story? I like it. And how can I make you the hero of the next story? Like how can I set you up to have an amazing outcome? Right. So those are some things that I think about to manage that immune response. That's such a great approach because there are, if you think about it, the other approaches have such intrinsic failure modes for people who've tried them before. Yeah. And I know you have come to this elegant approach through, I'm sure, a lot of <laughs> yes. a lot of, hard, a lot of failures as yeah, well. <laughs> hard lessons. So that's what I love so much about it because the way you describe it, I'm thinking through all the times I'm like, oh, yep. 
that's the mistake I made there. The mobile metal versus the people who hold the purse strings. Right. Those are different people. Right. The folks who are coincidentally working in the department or the business unit that is most ripe for innovation aren't necessarily the people who have the mindset and the interest and the passion to drive innovation. That's right. I did an episode with the creator of the barcode, the guy that led the team that created the barcode. Wow. It was just an amazing conversation. And he talked about it being an eight-year project. And when they finished, people pretended like they just flipped a switch and here's the barcode. And he went through all the back-end things. It was very much like the and contemporary with the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo mission. Mm. They had to invent the things to invent the things right. that they can invent the things with. Right. And there's only a small group of people that have that mindset. And finding those people is such a brilliant and simple first step. But it takes so much courage and so much patience. Yeah. And it's easy, especially if you're a consultant coming in or if you're a, an entrepreneur who's just had this project dropped on your desk. Mm hmm it's very easy to feel the pressure to demonstrate progress and to do things the way people expect it to look. Yes. And I would say that this is actually a problem, not just in entrepreneurship. It's also a problem in entrepreneurship, like external, like venture funded, mm. right? Yeah. You know, I'm old enough now that I've had many lives. <laughs> and so one of my lives for 20 years, I was a founder of startups. I did six different companies, right? Wow. So I've raised money. I've done services companies where I didn't have to raise money. I sold a product to Google, like all sorts of adventures in there. And in both the large organization innovation intrapreneur life and the external startup founder, et cetera, life, you have to live simultaneously with two stories. One story is the, what do I need to present to other people in a language that they can accept and understand in order for them to join my journey, in order for my reality distortion field of optimism and potential right. to wrap around them, I have to make my story accessible in whatever their vernacular is. Mm. The hard part is that then on the other hand, you can't just believe that. Right. Because that's a true story, but it is only one part of the truth. The other part of the truth is the hardcore factual validation that you're doing in this barcode story is a great example. It's like, what is the thing you have to invent to invent the thing you have to invent so that eventually you can get to this thing that looks like magic overnight. Mm -hmm. And so privately with your team, you're telling this unvarnished, much less pleasant truth. So we should talk about confidence and courage as a dynamic, right? Yes. You're having to courageously look failure in the face every single day and still choose to move forward and believe. Mm -hmm. And so it can be very difficult to hold both of those truths at once. One truth is the story that you're sharing with other people that make your adventure accessible to them. And the other is this really hardcore truth that you're not there yet and that you have to keep grinding in order to get to the place where you can get to the place where you can look like an overnight success. <laughs> exactly. That's so, so well said. It is. It's an entrepreneur's journey. It's an entrepreneur's journey. It's also, how can I put it? It's one of those things that I think it contributes, not saying that part out loud, which I thank you for, is part of what contributes to the imposter syndrome. Yes. And the misconception that you're the only person that has that messy closet. Right. And everybody else, that first story you talked about, everybody has that first story. And it's easy to think, oh, that's the whole story. If you're looking at it from the outside. That's right. And thinking, oh, I've got this other story. And so there must be something wrong with me. I must not be ready. And that other story, it must be shameful. Exactly. Exactly. Because nobody else is telling a story like that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So thank you for such an eloquent kind of juxtaposition of those two stories. And with your experience, having seen this happen, I think hopefully people will take that away from this conversation, if nothing else, that it's okay to have that other story running. Beyond okay, it's inevitable. A hundred percent of innovations, 
whether they're in an organization or in a startup, a hundred percent of those founders have the same messy closet. Mm. Like we need to normalize this because it's just too much of a burden to carry that shame and fear. So I occasionally will run startup accelerators because I just love working with founder stage. Like I love the founding stage and I love entrepreneurs, just love, love entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Hmm. And so one of the classes that never ceases to amaze me how impactful this particular class is, one session is always about confidence and courage. And what happens when I teach this class, so that basically the premise of the class is that confidence and courage are flip sides, right? Like either you have confidence or you need courage. Mm. Because if you're not confident, you're afraid, right? And if you're afraid, that's when you need courage. Mm. Confidence is effortless. Courage is effortful. And so if you can get yourself from a place where you require courage into a place where you can enact confidence, you can reduce the burden on you tremendously. Right. And so we look at why is there such a disparity in who gets venture funding, right? So something crazy like 95 plus percent every single year goes to the white guys. Right. I am married to a beautiful white man. I love white men. I'm not (laughs) anti-man. I am not anti-white. Like I love all these people. You're just stating the facts. There's a differential experience and that is just a fact, right? That's right. And that differential experience, I believe comes from confidence, courage. Mm. Those of us who speak the language, have the secret handshake, have shared context, can walk into a room knowing that no matter what happens, we're fine. Mm. The rest of us, it feels so high stakes. It feels like if I walk into, give a pitch to the senior vice president and they don't like it, my career could be over. That takes courage and that's exhausting. And so what I like entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to start to notice is when are you having to enact courage? And when does that attack on your experience as, as that innovator. Right. And what can you do to shore up, not to pretend to be confident, but to actually feel secure because confidence is not a projection. Confidence is not the shield. Oh, they look confident. So you need to appear confident. No, 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 it's not what I'm talking about. It's like bravado. or Yes. And it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Instead, what I'm talking about is that baseline security that says, I can care 10% less about the outcome of this meeting. I will be fine no matter what happens in this meeting. I'm entering into this meeting in order to get information so that I can make the next right decision. Mm. And so by taking the volume, by reducing the volume of pressure on any given interaction, we can reduce the exhaustion that it feels to be an iconoclast, to be a a disruptor, to be a person who doesn't kind of have the secret handshake, right? So I always tell people who are going out for funding that this is on the external side where you have a multiple funder environment. When you're an entrepreneur, you only have one funder, right? You know, that, that has its own dynamics. Sure. But when you're out there, you're on a search for your people. And if they're not your people, that's okay. If you have to talk to a thousand people to find your people, I'll bet your people are out there. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so your job going into whatever your financing meeting is, is to say, are you my people? I'm going to tell you my story. And if you're not my people, that's cool. No harm, no foul. I'm just going to go have another meeting with somebody else. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. So now how can we take that into our intrapreneurs And where the real risk is to their career, right? To their future promotability. Yes. How often have we heard that, you know, going into innovation is a career killer? What did I do wrong to get assigned to this entrepreneur project? Blah, blah, blah. Like, how sad is that? such a shame. (laughs) I was just thinking that. I was like, oh, man, that's... (laughs) Right? But you're like, okay, so what can I do to shore up my career potential so Mm -hmm. that I don't have to be quite as afraid? Mm -hmm. Right? So if you notice the fear and you're honest with yourself about, oh, oof, that little free song, that was fear. Okay. What's that fear about? Well, the fear is about like, maybe I won't get promoted if I mess this up. Okay. Well, how can I shore that up? Who can provide me with that protection? Right. Who are my advocates? Who are my sponsors? Right. Right. 
we can just be much more conscious and aware. Easy for me to say, hard to live and do. It's not easy to say. It's not easy to articulate. And you articulated it so well. And it's really important for it to be said by people who know and people who can say it clearly. I talk a lot about expertise and jargon. Mm. And when you see the usefulness of the jargon in your industry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. And when you start to talk to people who are outside of your area of expertise, outside of your domain, there's an opportunity to educate a bit. But for the most part, it's an additional skill. You can be an expert, but you also have to be able to talk about things clearly, simply, using simple language, I should say. Mm -hmm. And then also in a way that meets people where they are. And that's, I feel like, what you just did for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and probably everyone in between. So (laughs) thank you for that. It's my pleasure. Before I let you go, I want to touch on two things. One is your amazing book and how the insights that you've shared with us today fit in with your book. And then I'm going to ask you for advice for innovators. Awesome. Sure. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the book. Sure. So the book is here over my shoulder. If you're watching this on video, it's called Farther, Faster, and Far Less Drama. And I think you can tell that what I care about most in the world is just let's make some progress towards something important and let's just do it without the fuss, right? So I want people to be effective and ambitious and humane. Mm. And so the book is everything my husband and I have learned and we wrote it together. We have worked together in the past. And so we kind of work together for a while, then we separate and then we come back together and then we separate, right? So we, we go our own ways and then we bring our thoughts back. And both of us really just want to empower people to be effective. So this is everything that we've learned about modern leadership Mm. and how to get more done and have less drama doing it, right? Yeah, so that's what the book is. Several of the themes that we've touched on today were in it. That's fantastic. I haven't had the opportunity yet, but I'm going to make the purchase as soon as we get off. (laughs) Well, and you can just drop me an email and I'll send you a signed copy. Oh. Just tell me where to send it. That is so sweet. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's such a great title because Mm -hmm. I think it encompasses empathy. It encompasses, I feel like 15, 20 years ago, the big focus was on time management. Yes. And I think... GTD, get more done. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like now we're entering an era where we're understanding it's really more about energy management. Yes. And that drama is really such a huge energy drain. And if you run out of energy before you run out of time or money, you're going to stop. That's right. Even if you've got all those other things. You absolutely get what we were trying to talk about. And it is a very, it's a very different paradigm from thinking about how do I maximize my time? Yes. It's about how do I maximize my results? Yes. How can I create more results? Because it's not, it's not helpful to live in this sort of extractive paradigm where I'm going to give as much as I possibly can. What that means is that you're kind of always in a scramble. Your brain is scrambled. Your focus is scrambled. Your clarity is scrambled. Your energy is scrambled. What I want is mindful. I want to take a breath, get some sleep, wake up, and then crush it and just like do heroic big things. (laughs) And then take a breath, go to sleep. Get some sleep. (laughs) Get some sleep, right? Like be a good human. Right, right. Be my best self that contributes the most insight and effective results in the world. Mm, That is so great. I literally can't wait to read this book. And I'm so glad you stopped by to share these insights with us. You've shared so much wisdom. Is there any advice you would have, just a a key takeaway for people take nothing else away from this as innovators? Any advice? My advice is what you just brought up, and that's manage your energy, right? Mm. Really, rest is a requirement, not a reward. And that comes from my friend, Christina Wallace, who also published a book this year. It's a fantastic book. So credit to her. Mm. But the idea that it's the quiet moments, it's the wonder, it's peace. Those moments are what give you the clarity so that you can be optimally effective when you go into create change somewhere and that both are required. Right. Right. Uh, That's so great. So great. 
Thank you so much for your time, Janice Fraser. So much wisdom and insights. And I really appreciate you sharing and hope to stay in touch, stay connected. Absolutely, Jared. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to get more insights from innovators across the world. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional content and conversation. I hope to see you there. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.